Ben Charles Padilla was a 50-year-old from Pensacola, Florida. He was a licensed aircraft mechanic, flight engineer, and a pilot of small airplanes. He was on a job in Luanda, Angola, overseeing the refurbishing of a 727. On the evening of May 25, 2003, with the job almost completely done, an assistant and he went out to the plane to test its engines. Minutes later, the 727 rolled down the runway and took off. Neither the plane nor the men have ever been seen again. I'm Ed Densel, and this is Unfound. Since I was a little kid, I've been fascinated by mysteries and disappearances. I, as a kid, watched In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. It also helped that at that time I was slowly becoming a Star Trek fan. I continue to be a Star Trek fan to this day. But I can remember on Saturdays, I think the show used to be on Saturday afternoons for some reason that In Search Of was on and... I think now, by this time, being 46 years old, I think I've seen every episode. And then later, I think maybe when I got into my teenage years, my early 20s, I began to become fascinated, and what I guess you would say morbidly fascinated, with plane crashes. Maybe it helps that I don't like to fly that much. But, it, but I've become a walking encyclopedia for plane crashes. You tell me about a plane crash, I can probably tell you what caused it, the airline, maybe even the year, the location, just because I've watched every May Day episode that's out there. I've read every Wikipedia article. I've also watched Aircraft Investigation. I guess there's that show, what, 60 Seconds to Disaster, whatever that show is, that sometimes covers plane crashes. I've seen them all. And so I couldn't pass up the opportunity to do a show regarding the disappearance of a person and then possibly the crashing of an airplane. Seemed like the perfect combination, despite it being sad circumstances in which a family has lost a family member, in this case, Ben Charles Padilla. And we'll get into that uh, in the interview that I'm going to give you with this show. However, there's another part of this that I thought was interesting, and it's not just about me for the show, but for you, that you're going to be amazed to hear about the second-hand, third-hand, fourth-hand jet market that exists in the world these days. It is shadier than reverse mortgages. It is shadier than your average used car salesman. It is shadier than penny stocks or some of the shenanigans that go on on Wall Street. And in this interview that you're going to hear, you're going to start wondering how more of these planes don't end up in the wrong hands. And not just the wrong hands as we get into the interview, Uh, with drug runners or something like that, some group like that, but for terrorists. And in fact, with the year that Ben Charles Padilla and this jet that disappeared, it was 2003. It wasn't that long after the United States went into Iraq, not even two years after September 11th, and we know how the terrorists went about uh, conducting their attack on the World Trade Centers and the Pentagon and then the jet that went down in Shanksville. So you can imagine that there was a lot of concern regarding the disappearance of this jet. Now the reason the jet was there, it was originally a jet from American Airlines, a 727. If you don't know what a 727 is, it is a jet with three engines, two on the 
two at the back of the fuselage and then one up on the tail. There's another jet called an L-1011 or the DC-10 that are similar in design, but they're bigger than this uh, type of jet. It's more along the lines of the size of a 737. But it was there in Angola because it was going to be used to carry oil to the diamond mines throughout Africa. What was going on in Angola and elsewhere, there were civil wars going on, and the roads simply weren't passable. To try to get oil and machinery to these mines was just asking for the trucks and the equipment to get stolen or blown up, shot up, people, the drivers dead. So it was more efficient and... Safer and probably more cost effective at that point to fly the oil in. Now, you can imagine putting oil tanks in a jet is not a common enterprise. And once again, we get into the interview. I'm going to tell you who the interview is with in a matter of moments. But that's why the jet was there in the first place. It's call, t- call sign that the tail number of the plane was. N-844-AA. It was a 727 that was in pretty good condition when it got to Africa. And then it was used for some missions. And then what happened was the Civil War ended and then flying oil into these places did not... uh, You didn't need a jet anymore. You could simply then once again go back to trucking the oil in And at that point, it became uh, more cost-effective. Now, in this upcoming interview, the interview is actually with Tim Wright. I tracked him down, and he was so gracious to um, do uh, a couple talks. We had one – first, we had one conversation that went on for a while. And then a couple weeks later is when I did the interview with him that you will hear in its entirety, with no edits. He wrote an article uh, in 2010. It came out in 2010, but he worked on this story uh, for a while. And it was a story for Air and Space magazine. And if you look Tim up, you're going to find him to be a very legitimate writer. Uh, He did a lot of travel and research for this article, as he does for everything that he writes. He is uh, a well-known guy within the aviation industry, has a lot of good contacts uh, within the industry. And in his story, he was able to talk to many of the players in this story. And we threw around some names in this story uh, once I start in this interview, this start when you get to hear this interview. And you need to know who some of these people are because... Uh, we don't go into actually who they are. We just The names are kind of just mentioned, and we keep moving. You're going to hear the name Keith Irwin in this article. He was the South African businessman who was trying to put the deal together for his aircraft company to haul to the diamond mines. All right, So he was the one that went about finding this 727, this former American Airlines 727, in the first plate place part of a South African conglomerate that wanted to do business. They saw a business opportunity to make money. And Keith Irwin was the guy who brought the plane to Africa in the first place. You're going to hear the name Mari Joseph. He was the person who owned the 727 after it was with American Airlines. He owned, I don't know if he still does, but he owned a leasing company. So Keith Irwin was acquiring the jet, but he wasn't buying the jet. He was going to lease the jet from Mari Joseph. It would still be Mari Joseph's jet, even though it was over in Africa doing the, this job, being used for this purpose. You're also going to hear the name Mike Gabriel. Well, he works for Mari Joseph, and he was the guy who was sent to Africa when the jet went to Africa. And he was the one to make sure that Mari Joseph ended up getting his money from from Keith Irwin. So Mike Gabriel was over there keeping an eye on Ben Charles Padilla. He was, and he was the guy to make sure that the money eventually got back to Mari Joseph. 
And there's one more name that I, that was mentioned, Kip Hawley, H-A-W-L-E-Y. Uh, Tim mentions his name in talking to this guy regarding this disappearance. And Kip Hawley used to be the head of the TSA uh, in the United States. So like I said, and uh, Tim has a lot of great connections and – Doing this article, the article I will link to uh, for this show, you'll get to read the original article. I consider it to be the definitive article on the disappearance of Ben Charles Padilla and this jet. Uh, but he got to interview all of these people, and it is a fascinating story. Uh, it is also uh, a story that makes you wonder a lot about what is going on in the jet market even all these years later, the jet market, the second hand, fourth hand, third hand, fourth hand jet market is just as shady today as it was in 2003. And in fact, you'll hear in the interview that Tim Wright continues to work on this story to this day. He has a lot of suspicions that he voices in the interview. Uh, and I try to ask him the questions that I think all of you would ask him if you got a chance to talk to him. And also I ask him some clarifications about the jet so any of you out there who aren't familiar with jets can kind of get an idea of the jet, what it does, how people use it, the work that was being done on it, because I think it helps you understand the story. So here you go, my interview with Tim Wright, the writer of the definitive article on the disappearance of Ben Charles Padilla and the 727. He wrote it for Air and Space magazine in 2010. I'm calling this episode Ben Charles Padilla and the Darker Side of Aviation. And here's my interview with Tim Wright. Now on the show I have Mr. Tim Wright, uh, the person I considered to have written the definitive article on the disappearance of Ben Charles Padilla. Thanks for joining me today, Tim. Oh, my pleasure, sir. Um, like I said, I consider you to be the, the definitive source on this story. You wrote this story in 2010. Tell the listeners how you got involved, um, and then we'll just go from there. Well, I've been a, uh, a journalist with uh, working with Smithsonian Air and Space since uh, – the mid nineties. And, um, I've been very fortunate in that the vast majority of my assignments have been ideas that I suggested. So when this airplane first disappeared, uh, I was just agog by it. I just thought it was the most interesting thing. So I, I pitched it to my editors and you have to understand that air and space is a bi-monthly publication. So mm. it can't really do anything that's breaking news. So um, they took a pass on it at that time. Then years later, uh, they came back to me saying that they wanted to uh, do a, uh, a special issue on uh, mysteries, aviation mysteries. Interesting. Okay. And so I said, well, you know, we still have this, this 727 that's missing. And my editor said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Well, why don't you give me, you know, five or 600 words? And hmm. I did that. And then she says, well, why, why don't you go 800 to 1,000? I did that. And then she said, well, let's go ahead and go for maybe 2,000. And I did that. But by the time this story was turned in, I had hit like 12,000 words. And it was a never-ending expansion wow. into amazing, bizarre, and totally complete surprises. So uh, nobody, nobody was really prepared for where it went. So, but initially... The Air and Space magazine said I were a little leery on that, but then a few years later, what year would you say that you then really started jumping deep into this with both feet? 2009. It okay. took me a, about a year of digging and, and phone calling and searching, and uh, once I turned in the text, they they turned it around and put it in print pretty quickly. So, uh, yeah, just, just about a year or so. A lot of the stories I do have 
very, very long lead times, unfortunately. So what you're telling me is, you know, I get the feeling when you're talking about that this is almost like um, like when Watergate came along for Woodward and Bernstein. This is like a career-defining story. Would, would you call it that? I, yeah, that's not a bad bad analogy, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I certainly didn't realize I had a tiger by the tail when I grabbed it. Mm-hmm. And once the story came out in print, uh, people started contacting me <clears throat> out of the woodwork. You know, people that, that, that come from uh, the darker side of aviation or, or who are very familiar with it. And... Uh, that's that's where more, where my real education began because we went from looking at just one single airplane to a systemic industry wide uh, problem. Mm, right, and we're you know, and I hope to get into that in a little bit. So you, like you said, it was like a little bit of a maze trying to get to the bottom of all this. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Some of the people. And maybe that day where you figured out, man, this is a little bit more than I thought it was going to be. Well, there, there, there wasn't a, a, a specific day that I went, holy crud. You know, okay. Got, uh, it, was, it was just a slow, fascinating evolution. And it, 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 and it became a, a compulsion to me. And, uh, you know, some, some people will say that it still is because I'm still working on this yeah. story. And yeah, because it's you know, not... It's unsolved. It's unsolved, and new information comes in even now, although not with the the speed that it once did. So uh, we still kick we still kick things around. But one of the most helpful contacts I made was with Mike Gabriel, mm-hmm. who had been uh, hired by Mari Joseph, who who owned the airplanes, mm-hmm. operated the airplane. Uh, Mike. Uh, Mike was invaluable to me. He was, uh, he was always available for a phone call. He always shared whatever he knew with me. Uh, uh, he, he was just a huge, huge assistance in the initial uh, chasing of the story. Yeah. And uh, Mari Joseph, uh, I, I had the opportunity to speak it with him on, at, on numerous occasions, and he provided some, some great information. And... Uh, one or two of the uh, original crew members uh, were very helpful as well, uh, but most of the most of the American crew did not want to talk about this in any way, shape, or form. They 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 just wanted to close their eyes and let the whole thing go away. These were the crew. These were the crew members that were originally hired to fly the plane in Africa for its intended use to haul oil to these diamond mines. That's correct. Okay. And why why do you think they were afraid? What do you what do you think? Uh, because they broke a lot of rules. Oh. Uh, the FAA has some very distinct uh, rules you have to you have to follow, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, their modification of the of the aircraft with the fuel tanks took place outside of the United States to get around some of those rules and regulations. Um, they, they did some, one of the crew members, you know, admitted to, uh, uh, scavenging off a recently crashed 727. In fact, an aircraft that had crashed just before they did, they, uh, they, they helped the, the, the crew of this other 727 get out of there. But before they helped them, they helped themselves to some of the parts that they needed for their airplane. Wow. Yeah, and there's just that's just a small sampling of some of the craziness that went on. So the plane, so, I, so the plane was never used for it in its intended use. It sat there for a while. Uh, no. Okay, it did. It, um, it, it, uh, it, it's it's a complex. <laughs> it's a complicated story. Yeah. Uh, uh, the airplane. Or Keith Irwin, the South African who who arranged the cruise and brought it over, mm-hmm. uh, ran out of cash, and uh, the deal that he had made with some Angolan folks uh, went south very quickly, and uh, his partners down in South Africa were not happy, 
And uh, this, the crew was scared, literally. Some of them thought they weren't going to get out of there alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then that those crews, I think they might have flown one or two flights or two or three flights. Anyway, uh, the aircraft eventually made about 17 sorties. Oh, that many? Flights. I didn't know that. Okay, 17. Yeah, 17. And then it sat on the ramp for about uh, 14 months or so before uh, uh, Ben Charles Padilla showed up and uh, got the aircraft airworthy again, and, and then that's when it, when it disappeared. What, what killed the, the, the main deal for this airplane was the piece that came to Angola. And, uh, you know, the airplane was delivering uh, diesel fuel to all these uh, rebel-held uh, diamond mines mm -hmm. from the communist capital of Luanda. And the fact that it was crossing the front lines every day, uh, to me, is still just just amazing. It is. But the roads were just not an option. They just weren't an option. But once the peace came, those roads opened up immediately. And the market for these fuel, these fuel deliveries being made by aircraft imploded because it was far mm -hmm. cheaper to do it by, by truck. Right. So when the piece hit, the airplane lost its market, and it just basically sat there on the ramp in Luanda until Padilla showed up. Let's talk about Mr. Padilla being that he is the, the reason um, I became interested in this, being that he's still a disappeared person. Um, he's a little bit of a – he was a guy who kind of went around the world, it seems, to places like this to fix planes. Yeah, that's that's true. Mari Joseph had hired him to uh, go to Nigeria. Uh, Jeff Swain, who was also in the uh, large aircraft business, had hired him to do some work for him in in Indonesia. And I talked to uh, some friends of his that had flown with him down into South America and some other places. And I I talked to some folks who who knew him uh, from his days working in Nigeria. So. Yeah, Mari said uh, that he was the kind of guy you could send to just about any part of the world to do a job, and he would do it. Uh, in reading your article, and I'm going to link to that when we, we get the, the show post and everything, people will be able to click on the link, read your original article. But you give kind of a um, – almost a paradoxical view. Some people thought the world of Mr. Padilla, others – thought that he was a little bit of a big talker. You know, what did you decide regarding Mr. Padilla in this? Uh, some, some of the stories I heard from people that knew him firsthand were were horrifying. Mm. Uh, it, was, it, it, was very, it was very difficult at times for me to uh, be sympathetic to the gentleman. Okay. Uh, and I wanted to be. Right, <laughs> right. Know? Right, an American disappears in Africa. Your natural inclination is to feel that way, sure. Right, right, right. Well, the the more I learned about him uh, and his colorful ways and past, uh, the harder it was to become sympathetic to him. Now, his family, his poor family, I my heart goes out to him because mm -hmm. uh, uh, they believed in and uh, they called him uh, Charles. Uh, okay. They believed in in Ben and loved him, and uh, you know always thought the best of him. Uh, but there were there were other people who who knew him away from home, and, and if you talk to uh, many folks who have been in Africa for an extended period of time, you'll, it's not uncommon to hear how that continent uh, can change folks. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's uh there's not a sense of rules that uh that exist here. I mean, in in so many ways, it's 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 the wild wild west, and some people react to that freedom with uh, abandonment in many ways. Right, and he might he could have maybe gotten caught up in that being over there maybe so often uh, over time. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, you know he he had a um, he was married. He had a daughter over here, mm -hmm. and he had an adopted child. And I I spent a lot of time talking to his daughter and and his goddaughter, mm 
And, uh, you know, even the two of them describe very different people. Hmm. Uh, almost a night and day kind of relationship. And, uh, you know, it's just when, when, he, but when, when he was here in the States, you know, I, I heard stories of, you know, bravado and daring do and and this kind of stuff. And then I I would hear from other people who would say, uh, you know, it's complete smoke and mirrors on that. Uh, it was it was the, the people who traveled with him overseas that uh, and worked with him overseas that that really had the most disturbing things to say. Mm. But he was, I mean, to put him in layman's terms, was he a, a mechanic? Is that the way that the average person would understand his job and doing what uh, he was doing? No, no, oh. he was not. A, he was a flight engineer. Okay. He was a a, a systems management kind of guy. Uh, the seven twenty seven was uh, a sports car of an airliner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had a complex fuel system, and this was all before the age of computers and and managed digitally managed fuel systems. So somebody had to sit there at the engineers panel and watch the fuel flows and manage them and control how what tank was you know being drawn from and all this kind of good stuff. Okay. Well, he he he, he while he certainly did a lot of. Uh, more kind of what we call wrench turning, mm -hmm. uh, not an AMP to my understanding. Uh, he had done some sheet metal work before he got into aviation, but uh, in order to be licensed to actually work on an aircraft, you have to have an, a an FAA license, an airframe and power plant license. And to my knowledge, he did not have that. But he would, as flight engineer, he would be familiar with all the fuel systems, the hydraulic systems, the electrical systems. Uh, he would know the, the guts of the airplane in a, in a very very efficient, knowledgeable way. Okay, and he must have been capable, being that he kept getting rehired to do jobs over and over, even though his, maybe his personal life was questionable. But doing that, being that he keeps getting rehired, I'm going to guess he was competent. Uh, uh, I don't, I don't know how to respond to that. Okay. Um, uh, I'm not really sure just how competent he okay. was at it. Uh, but you're right. He did get, he did get rehired and he did get hired for people, but he also got fired from people too. So, um, even, uh, even in the Miami area, Mike Gabriel knew him mm -hmm. and, uh, he, he didn't have anything kind to say about him. And uh, one of Mike's dear buddies thought the world of him. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really uh, a quandary. That's almost, it's almost like a, a Jekyll and Hyde type of thing going on there. You know, one person thinks the world of him, another one doesn't want anything to do with him. That's interesting. Um, well, like I said at the beginning of the show, that I thought that to understand this disappearance, you under, have to understand the world of the buying and selling of planes on the secondary or even lesser than that market. Tell the listeners a little bit about the airline market before we go too further. You know, what happens to a plane after it's with Southwest or American Airlines in this situation and then goes to a second carrier, then to a third carrier? In, in my feeling in reading your article, it's a, it sounds a little bit shady and, and very um, – I don't know, once again, to use that word, kind of a maze. Oh, you're absolutely right. It is. It is. It does get shady, and it does get uh, uh, into a maze scenario. Uh, in fact, those, some of those mazes are very deliberate. Okay. Uh, planes are deliberately made to disappear in piles of paperwork. Uh, let's go back to 2001, 2002. Uh, the 727 was up till the 737, the most single most popular airplane Boeing ever made. I mean, they made gajillions of them. Okay. And uh, after 9/11, passenger traffic plummeted, and the airlines were 
we're, we're hurting. And uh, they were looking at ways to save money. And they looked at their 727s and they thought, you know what? This is a great airplane, but it's expensive to run. Its fuel economy is not the best. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they started unloading the 727s by a dozen. And they were buying the the seven three sevens, the newer five seven five sevens, and seven six sevens, mainly because of their fuel efficiency. So uh, uh, these seven twenty sevens, which may have cost them, you know, like thirty five million dollars brand new, uh, were going for a song. And uh, in fact, this plane itself, in your article, it said went for a million dollars. Was sold for a million. Yeah. That's like nothing. Yeah. I mean, that is unbelievable to me. To me. Well, I've seen ch- prices that are even cheaper than that. Wow. Uh, you get to the point where the cost of maintaining the aircraft, keeping it legal, is more than the aircraft is worth. So airplanes, airliners have to go through periodic heavy-duty maintenance programs. Uh, and... Uh, uh, there's an A check, which isn't too bad. There's a B check that's a little more serious. And then there's a C check, which is a very expensive proposition. And then you go into a D check, which is essentially a, almost a total rebuild of the airplane. And it's easy for a C check to be more expensive than the airplane is even worth. So that's where things start start getting really shady because mm. – uh, you're a, an unscrupulous operator, you, you might say, well, you know what? I'll, um, I'll buy that thing, and I'm going to fly the doors off of it as long as I can or until I get caught. And that's what happens. And most, most airplanes that are reaching that stage of life where it's sometimes more valuable to part the airplane than to sell, sell it, even though it's fully airworthy, mm. a lot of those airplanes go to Africa and Asia. And the ones in Africa tend to, to to disappear or to be crashed or to just get damaged beyond repair. And airfields around Africa are, are littered with the holes of airplanes that would have only minor damage here in the United States that would be well worth fixing uh, if the aircraft was new. But... Over there, it's just not worth the, the time and money and effort it is to to, mm. to repair it. So they just walk away from it. And that's very common over there. And then what will happen is somebody will have an airplane that's fully flyable, but it needs that really expensive D-check, and they don't want to spend the money to do it. And then they'll stumble across another airframe that's parked on the side of a runway somewhere that is, you know, it's, It's got weeds growing up through it. It'd never, ever fly again. Mm -hmm. But the plate on it indicates that it's got maybe another 1,000 hours before it has to go into a D-check. So the enterprising and unscrupulous guys will take the data plate off the, 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 the worthless airplane and switch it with the data plate on the airplane that they're flying. Oh, my. So suddenly... The airplane that's flying just vanishes from the rolls. Nobody knows what happens to it. It just it just disappears, and it it's reincarnated with the same serial number as the airplane that's sitting on the side of some, you know, dirt airstrip in the middle of nowhere. And that's that's what happens a lot of times. And, and when that happens, the aircraft is not getting the safety checks that it needs, and it, it can become a dangerous airplane just for the crews to fly in. And bringing this back to this particular 727, what would it? What, what was its data plate, and what situation was it in at the point that Ben Charles Padilla and it disappeared? Well, four yeah, four Alpha was in wonderful shape before it left the United States. Uh, some of the, one of the the uh, flight crew members, one of the flight engineers, says. It was the best airframe of the lot that they had to choose from, and uh, it was in just great shape. So before they left Miami with it, they ripped out all the seats. They ripped out all the overhead insulation and the panels and everything. They gutted the interior of the aircraft. Then once they got it into uh, Africa, 
uh, I can't remember the reason why, but they, they punched a hole in the pressure hull of the aircraft, which means the aircraft could no longer be pressurized, mm. which means you can't fly it at altitude where it's most efficient fuel-wise. So uh, according to Jeff Swain, who looked at the aircraft, he said it was a piece of junk. It, was, it wasn't even worth buying, but it had great engines on it. And the engine alone made it made it a a, a viable uh, piece of property, and so that's what his interest was. Was he didn't care about the airframe? All he wanted was the were the engines on it. And so Ben Charles Padilla gets sent sent to Angola. He's working on this plane. That particular day, he goes out there. He has this assistant with him. They go out to the plane, and and we'll get into that in a second. And the plane takes off, and it disappears. Are you telling me that it probably couldn't have reached altitude? You know, I don't know what the would it be ten thousand feet, fifteen thousand feet before it needed to be pressurized, or or what would the case be for something like like that? Well, you're supposed to be on oxygen above fourteen thousand feet. So the aircraft not being able to be pressurized meant it was going to be restricted to less than fourteen thousand feet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, it wouldn't. It, it, it's rain, and this is a point that we're we're investigating right now, very acutely. Okay. Is just what kind of range that aircraft had at the lower altitudes. Some airplane engines, uh, the fuel costs more than doubles if it has to fly at that altitude. But the information we're getting right now is that the penalty for the 727 was not as severe as it is in current aircraft. And that has serious impact on how far the airplane could have gone on that initial day that it disappeared. Right. I guess we're doing a little foreshadowing uh, regarding all of this. Um, but how much fuel do you, was in the plane? I know I asked you this when we first talked. Uh, how much fuel was in the plane when it took off that day? But that's another point that we're still trying to ascertain. Wow. Now, aircraft carried uh, – what's it, 8,090 gallons of internal fuel. It's made to carry that much fuel. Mm -hmm. But the tanks on the inside of the aircraft, which were meant to carry diesel fuel, there were 10 of them, and they each had 500 gallons. So you had another 5,000 gallons of potential fuel inside the aircraft. Now, more than one flight engineer has told me it would be really easy to plumb those tanks into the main fuel system. We have one report where uh, <clears throat> the day before the airplane disappeared, that somebody walked into the fuel shack at Luanda and paid $93,000 in cash. <laughs> well, wow. if you knew the price of Jet A fuel at that time, you would be able to figure out just how much fuel was loaded into the aircraft. Was it just the the normal tanks, or was it the normal tanks plus the tanks inside the cabin? Mm-hmm. That's what we're trying. That's one of the things we're trying to figure out right now. Uh, just ballparking it, being that you're not just a writer, but you are you have you, you are a pilot. You have your license. You're you're experienced in flying. What would would that come close, just off the top of your head? Ninety three thousand dollars. I mean, how many? What was the price of jet fuel at that time? Well, we're we're still trying to to nail that down. Okay. And, okay. And uh, I actually contacted a colleague of mine who's been instrumental in the search in Paris, and he turned around and contacted a one of his guys who's in Iraq of all places. Hmm. So this is very much a, a, a global story with people all over the world looking for it. Uh, 13 years later, still 13 years later. Yes. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, if you if you add the two volumes together, you're looking at about 13,090 gallons of gas. If you divide that by $93,000, you come up with a fuel price of about $4.5 a gallon. That is not outside the realm of possibility. But, you know, mm-hmm. it's hard to tell how much of that 93000 was just fuel and was, was it for past fuel, was it for current fuel, or, and how much of it was bribing the fuel guys. Because I, one of the guys that was really helpful to me actually helped 
steel a 727 out of a, a small island in the South Pacific. And it, it was actually more of a repossession. And one of the first things they did was they went to the fuel shack, they paid for the gas, they paid the guys that worked there to keep their mouth shut, and then they went up to the tower, paid the tower a little bit of money to keep their mouth shut, and then once everybody was paid off, they hopped in the airplane real quick, fired up the engines, took off, and re-reclaimed the aircraft. Oh, my gosh. That, that's, a, that's a fascinating story. Just on a side note, does, is this happen, does this happen more often than the average person realizes? Uh, thing, stories like that of repossessions. I know there was a reality show from a few years ago about like private planes and little Cessnas getting repossessed. But something you like – you watch that show, and I know the gentleman you're talking about, mm. and yes, he does that. He shows up at, at the airfield. I've seen him grab Airbus 310s, uh, 319s, stuff like that, and, you know, he walks in with all the paperwork. He works as fast as he can before the people that are controlling the aircraft find out, and he tries to get out of there because it can get very ugly very quickly. Yeah, I bet. Because you're – how big money here. Yes. People get really unhappy and do things they might not otherwise do when big money is at stake. Yeah. Yeah, this isn't somebody's 2011 Honda Accord that's getting repossessed. It's a little bit bigger deal than that. Um, let's, let's cover one more aspect of, of this that I think is of importance regarding all this. Once again, because I think we're foreshadowing a little bit. Tell the listeners a little bit about African radar. And flying in that country. Well, Africa's a continent. Yeah, so a con this, yeah, a continent. I'm sorry. Yes, a continent, of course. Um, most people think that we there's global coverage of radar, and that's it's just not the case. It's just not the case. Even here in the United States, there are large regions of this country that are not subject to low altitude radar. Mm -hmm. It gets infinitely worse once you go overseas. Now, most long-range radars only go out 250 nautical miles thereabout. But if you're fly, and because of the curvature of the Earth, it's real easy to get under that radar, and nobody would know you were there. On top of that, you have radars only in the primarily only in the capitals and only in the richer countries in Africa. Hmm. There are huge areas of that continent where there's no radar coverage whatsoever. And a lot of people think that the NSA can see everything that's happening over there, and they can't. There is an over-the-horizon radar that is operated in places like uh, Crete, uh, and it's looking towards uh, Syria and Iraq and that, mm -hmm. those areas. Uh, there's three radar stations, that uh, one of them here in Virginia that is watching the Caribbean, uh, there's another one down in uh, Puerto Rico that's also watching out over the Car uh, uh, Caribbean, and these are all these. Most of these radars are looking in the United States are looking for drug runs, mm -hmm. but those radars have no accuracy to them. They just they know there's somebody out there. So, in order to track something accurately, you need a tracking radar, and they're just they're even if. Even if there was an over-the-horizon radar out there over Africa, it's not going to cover the whole continent. And there's most certainly not very much tracking radar. So uh, it's, it's easy for somebody to take off and get just outside of a capital area, and that's wild, wild west line. And I've experienced that myself. That's one of the great allures of Africa for a pilot yeah. is that – Basically, you can do anything you want to once you get outside of a populated area. So now that we've culminated all this information, we know a little bit about the man, we know a little bit about the aircraft, we know a little bit about the market that is seems to be shady of uh, aircraft on the secondary and lesser markets. What did Ben Padilla and this uh, associate of his um, uh, that I can't think of his name right at this second, but John Mutantu. Thank you. Could they have stolen this jet? Absolutely. What the F I, I found an FOIA with uh, uh, the FBI, and I got back 
lots of redacted documents, but I don't think the FBI ever realized that the Congolese national, Jean Mutantu, was a flight engineer. That guy was fully rated on the 727, the 707, and numerous other aircraft as a flight engineer. And I never saw anything in the paperwork that suggested that the FBI was aware that he was a, a competent, well-regarded flight engineer. Hmm. Now, part of the problem in all this was that there were two Mutantus. And this was when I discovered that I had two Mutantus, it was, it was just mind-boggling. When the Americans were in Luanda, they hired what they said was a 19-year-old kid who was local. And uh, he said his name was John Mutantu. The kid was used to do nothing but haul fuel hoses, to do nasty, dirty work, and he knew nothing about airplanes. The Congolese national Mutantu was a professional aviator. Wow. And I don't think the FBI ever put that together. Wow. Now, we should be clear about one thing, and you can explain maybe a little bit to the listeners. Technically, uh, a 727 needs three people to fly it. Technically, you know. It, right. Now that is different than today. If people on a passenger jet, 737, 757, they only see a pilot, a co-pilot in the cockpit. But on a 727, when it was built, it was made for three people to be in the cockpit, right? That is absolutely correct. But it doesn't need three people to technically fly it. It, it doesn't need three people to fly it as long as nothing goes wrong. Okay. Now, the flight engineer position, in many, many cases, was a stepping stone to co-pilot and then pilot. So guys who are rated in the right and left seat a lot of times already have had the job of the flight engineer. So it would be really easy or let's say a co-pilot who used to be a flight engineer to hop up from his seat, go to the engineer's position right behind him, and set all the knobs and switches that are needed for a departure, which is the most complex part of the flight. And then he hops back into his seat and he helps the pilot manhandle the aircraft. And then once they're at altitude, he pops up again, he adjusts the, the fuel flows and, and uh, you know, which tanks are being emptied, and then gets back into a seat. So it is possible. I've heard more than one pilot, co-pilot, who had that flight engineer experience. So, yeah, it could be done, but not if something was going wrong. If you had problems, then you really had problems. So what you're saying is Ben Charles Padilla, with his qualifications and his spirit experience, and this uh, this other person, they could have gotten that plane off the ground and up to a certain uh, alt altitude to fly it. No. no, Ben Charles Padilla was not a qualified pilot. Oh, okay. He had a private pilot's license, but I never talked to anybody that said he would be competent to fly a 727. A 727, it's a hot rod of an airplane. And it's, you got, you got to be sharp, you got to be on your game. Uh, I know a pilot who tried to help Ben go from the flight engineer's position to a co pilot's uh, position in a, in a four engine jet called the DC 8. And Ben was his friend. Mm -hmm. And he told me, Ben couldn't hold altitude, he couldn't hold heading, he couldn't handle the aircraft. And if he couldn't handle that aircraft, he wasn't going to be able to handle the 727. There had to be three people on that flight deck the night it left. Wow. Wow, see, this is something that I, you know, I've read your article recently, but I don't think you put that in the article, but I know originally when we talked a few weeks ago, you had told me that, and that was new, in, you know, new information to me. Um, do you have any suspicion of who that third person might have been? Yeah, I'm pretty confident I know exactly who he was. And I know pretty much exactly where he is. But unfortunately, I don't have any way to get to him. Could you reveal his name today on this show? Oh. No. No.
Okay. I had to try. Um, but you're, but what you're saying is this person is still alive, this third person. At last report, he was, and I've had huh. uh, recently asked for some folks with connections in that part of the world to verify he is still with us. But he, this gentleman that I'm referring to was a certified 727 pilot, and he was in Luanda, and he knew some of the players involved in this little saga. So it's interesting to me in listening to all this that only two people were seen going to the plane, but your suspicion is there was a third person who was part – could have been, could have been. I mean we don't technically know. It's still unsolved, but could have been on the plane as well. It just was not seen getting on the plane – at that time of the day or, or something. Somehow he got onto the plane without anybody else seeing it. Yeah, very likely. And there was a report that 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 uh, two people were seen in the cockpit on the flight deck, pilot mm -hmm. and co-pilot. Well, you wouldn't be able to see the flight engineer um, if you were looking from the ground up into the cockpit because – the flight engineer sits behind the co-pilot, and he's in a, a little a little hole. It'd be almost impossible mm. if from the ground. But Mutantu was an African, and the two folks that were described as being in the right and left seat, neither one of them were described as African. Huh. Yeah, just to give the – you know, being that I know uh, – at least I've seen a 727 cockpit before – the flight engineer sits behind on the right side of the plane, you know, not very close to the pilots. I mean, it's farther than like the back seat of a car. It's farther behind than that, right? Not really? Oh, it's oh, about no. that close. Okay. Yeah, they are. They're they're pretty daggum close. I mean, oh, you okay. can, if you're in the right seat, you can turn around and put your hand on the shoulder of the flight engineer. All right. Okay, but still, that would be enough that the, the of course the windshields in any jet is not are not too big, so yeah, it would be difficult to see somebody uh, in, in the back seat. Um, so I guess what we're saying here is there's a, there's a lot of evidence out there that Ben Charles Padilla, along with these two other gentlemen, are are still alive. So let's talk a little bit about that. The, as you have stated, um, Ben Charles Padilla, there have been sightings of him. Yes, yes, and uh, there were reports that he was sighted in uh, in Kinshasa, Kinshasa in the Congo, uh, mm -hmm. the Democratic Republic of the Congo, mm -hmm. and I have reports that Mutantu's wife had word that uh, her husband was stuck in a jail in Nigeria, and there are other reports uh of the aircraft actually being spotted in Kinshasa in 2010 by another 727 pilot and his co-pilot. Wow. And obviously this third, this third person that you suspect was involved, he's somewhere as well. He's been oh, yeah. spotted. He's not, he's not in a jail. Oh. Uh, he's not in a jail, but he's out there somewhere. A free man. Yep. Wow. Um, and, he, and so Ben Charles Padilla – see, the reason I bring this all up is because when I, I remember first hearing about this, um, I think some of the listeners realized I, have, I do have a fascination with a little bit with plane crashes and things. And I remember when this happened. You know, My first belief was that this guy maybe was suicidal, got on this plane, and crashed it into the ocean. And you know, then I read your article, and I hear all this information since, and it's totally changed my mind, and I thought this is why this is such – this was such a uh, you know a compelling case. Um, do you think that uh, you obviously continue to work on this case? Do you think do you have hopes that one of these days, if Ben Charles Padilla is still alive, that you're going to be able to track him down? Or is that what you're trying to do right now? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it'd be fair to say uh, I I think he's still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I know where. He has been. He's probably not there now. Mm -hmm. But some old-time African pilots have told me there are no secrets in Africa. Mm 
somewhere somebody knows what happened. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that's the case. Uh, the people that know just don't want anybody else to know. Now, let's be clear about something. This isn't – you're not saying, I, I think, you're not saying that this was some sort of insurance fraud. This was something else. Is that right? No, I wouldn't say that. Okay. I don't, I don't know what it was. I mean there are certain arguments that can be made in each case, and the Padilla family would be outraged uh, to hear anybody say mm. that Ben was involved in the theft. Right. No, no family wants to hear that, of course. Sure. And and they're absolutely convinced of that. Now, is that a possibility that it, it was done for an insurance thing? I have a hard time believing that because uh, in order to have uh, an insurance claim, you got to have a damaged aircraft. And if you don't have the aircraft, how can you show it's damaged? Mm-hmm. Right. And airplanes – that are stolen, you know, it kind of falls in a gray area. Uh, Maury Joseph told me that uh, there was no insurance claim made. Uh, I've heard other people say that there were plans for an insurance claim made, but the insurance company was a Nigerian fraud, and it was never a viable institution in the first place. So, hence... There was no money to be paid because there was none that existed. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, there just there are just so many different plausible explanations. Uh, I'm I'm not inclined to to go with insurance fraud. Okay. Was there anything, you know, being that you, I mean, obviously that you covered that time around 2003 that this plane disappeared. Was there anything? Like politically or something like that going on in in Africa at the time where somebody would have said, you know what, I'd really like to have a jet, something like that. Well, uh, you know, you got to remember, two thousand and three was was pretty soon after nine eleven. Right. Yeah, we haven't even touched upon that yet. Sure, sure. And uh, at the time the aircraft disappeared, I think it was a week after it disappeared. There was a G seven meeting in Europe. And the intelligence community was just almost in a panic about what the heck this airplane could be doing because mm-hmm. it would have had the range to made it to Europe and done another, you know, Twin Towers kind of attack. It could have hit any capital in the African continent. Uh, the Israelis were real concerned about it because – they were a natural target. So you had the intelligence communities of a number of countries working very hard to figure out where the airplane went. And none of them succeeded, to my knowledge. And if they did, they sure didn't tell the FBI about it. And they sure as heck have managed to keep it quiet because none of the other folks that are in a position to know that kind of information have said anything about it. Uh, Kip Hawley was the uh, director of the TSA at the time. And the incident so scared him that he got down to knowing the serial numbers on Boeing aircraft parts. And they were watching wow. for any parts that had serial numbers that matched uh, that aircraft. Every part on an airplane has a number on it. And that's part of the reason why it's impossible to really hide an airplane uh, by just switching the data plate because the serial numbers on the landing gear or the wing flaps or the elevators or the rudder, you know, all those numbers have got to match. And uh, that's how you unmask an airplane as a fraud. You know, you compare what the data plate says it is, and then you go through and you look at all the serial numbers on the rest of the aircraft and see what they indicate. And just to be, just to be sure, if so, uh, there's no way I know this sounds crazy, but just for the layman, there's no way somebody could go through there and like take all those numbers off all those parts. That just could not conceivably no. be done. No, and that, that would leave such a huge trail in its own right. right. You know, right. That's a, a good point. Right, right. 
a part that doesn't have a serial number doesn't have any paperwork behind it to uh, document its lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have a serial number, you can't legally use it. So then you have to put it in an otherwise already illegal aircraft. And if you wipe all the serial numbers off an airplane, somebody's going to notice that pretty quickly. <laughs> Somebody sooner or later. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, do you believe that that 727 is flying around in Africa right now, 13 years later? No, I don't. You don't? Oh. I, I okay. think after my story came out in 2010, that airplane probably went somewhere and very quietly got chopped up. Just because of all the attention, and I know that the article that you wrote was very, very popular. I know you told me the, the statistics regarding how many people have read it over the last six years, and it's it's uh, it, it's quite incredible. And you should be uh, you know quite proud of that. I can I can see why somebody might have done that. Yeah, five five million people read it on the uh, off the Air and Space Magazine's website, and uh, I have been approached by many many people subsequently. Uh, who, who have read that article and just been staggered by it. So, yeah, it was, yeah. It was a pretty amazing journey, and it, it, it started me down a real uh, dark path. Uh, it, uh, it got, it got kind of scary there for a while. Yes, you told me, if you, you, you can say this, uh, if you want to answer this, you actually did get some threats. Yeah, well, let's say I got lots of very stern warnings. Okay. Uh, from folks from within the intelligence community, from folks that uh, were in law enforcement, from uh, local pilots in Angola. Uh, yeah, three or four times I was, I was told that if I went over there looking for this airplane, I would most likely came back, come back in a body bag if I came back at all. That it would be very likely that uh, a door would open somewhere over the jungle and I'd get thrown out the airplane. <laughs> Yeah, that, remind, that reminds me of that movie, The Good Shepherd, with Matt Damon from about eight years ago where they pushed that girl out of a plane uh, in Africa, I think. Wow. Why do you think that is? I mean, this is just a plane, uh, you know, a plane. This is just, uh, you know, an aircraft engineer, an American. Um, wh what do you money. think? The money. It all goes back to money. Uh, you know, I got into aviation and, and ultralights and gliders, and gradually, as my career went through the, its, its track, I, I, I became involved in larger and larger aircraft. And, it, and, it, and it, I noted that the larger and the more expensive the aircraft, the less savory some of the people are that are involved with it. Yeah. And, you know, you got to look at how some of these ghost aircraft, and that's what they call an airplane who's data plate doesn't match who it is or or if it's flying in Africa without a, uh, a registration number at all or if the registration doesn't match the the uh, the paperwork on it mm -hmm. these aircraft are, are showing up in nefarious purposes like I found one 727 in the middle of the desert in Mali and it apparently had landed after flying in from South America offloaded uh, nine tons of cocaine into the, uh, uh, I don't want to say the hands of Al-Qaeda, but there is a, uh, a, uh, a notorious uh, bandit uh, in central Mali who uh, allied himself with uh, Al-Qaeda, and he took on the French uh, when they tried to take over the, Mo the Mali government. But anyway, this... You know, running drugs is a mm. huge issue. People have no idea how much drugs are being flown out of South America and into West Africa. Mm. And what will happen is they'll land in some place like the desert in Mali. They'll offload it into four-wheel drive vehicles, and the vehicles go roaring across the open desert all the way up to North Africa and, and uh, the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And from there, it gets smuggled across the Med into Europe. And that's where the final destination is. If they're not doing drug running, they may be doing gun running. You know, yeah. uh, the UN monitors weapons movement as closely as they can. Uh, it would be real easy for somebody to load up, you know, a bunch of 
RPGs or, or AK-47s or ammunition and move it from point A to point B, and nobody would want that known. Or they could be picking up uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, armaments coming in from uh, the Iranians that are destined to some of their uh, Shiite uh, Confederates, and they sure as heck aren't going to want somebody to know that that last mile or two is being done by an aircraft. So, uh, and then there's people smuggling, and then yeah. there's just out out crime. So, um, these aircraft that are 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 available so cheap uh, are expendable. And uh, that 727 that was burned in Mali, it may have been burned simply because it was an acceptable business expense. You know, we got we got mm. our nine tons of cocaine worth what five hundred million dollars or something. What what's an airplane that's worth five hundred thousand dollars? Nothing. It's a drop bucket. Nothing. So torch it. Walk away from it. You know, I'm listening to all this, and I think I, I, I said this the first time we talked, and I, I'm going to ask you this again. How much should the average American be troubled by all of this? You know, that's that's. That's a difficult question. Um, you know, it's not like it's there are hundreds of aircraft out there doing this, mm -hmm. but there are enough of them out there that our governments definitely are concerned. Uh, I knocked on the doors of just about every agency in the in the D.C. area and said, "I'm I'm looking at these." these missing aircraft, and the public affairs officer will go, wow, I had no idea. Let me look into this. I'll get right back to you. And then I never heard another word from them. And I would call them, and I would call them, and I would never get another return call back until I talked to Kip Holland. And he told me that what I was talking about was so classified and so black that the people I was talking to probably had no idea what was going on and that the that the, the insiders were not even going to be telling the people talking to me what was going on. So, you know, how many, how many, how many 727s do you need to crash into another Twin Towers? Right. One. So, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, I don't want to fear monger or mm. anything, but it's it's definitely something that needs to be thought about. I well, I can tell you, I'm not a fear monger, uh, but I can tell you that. I hear what you're saying. I read your story, and I know you did a follow-up story also about you know the jet market, the the shadier side of it. And I just wonder how it is that we haven't had something like that since 2001. It almost is to like to the point where I hear you talking, and I hear well, why did they even bother hijacking our planes when they could have gotten something on the black market and done the same thing? You know, what I mean, that almost would seem like it's be easier. Or somebody hasn't done it since then, being that this market seems to be so loose and there are ways to get around the rules? Uh, you know, there are a lot of people that are worried about that very mm. much. You know, uh, it would be, th and that was one of the nightmare scenarios, that they mm. would get an airplane like this, they would put together a crew, and they'd go out and they'd buy a small nuke from the North Koreans or maybe the Iranians, and they would load it onto the airplane, and they would char you know, announce a charter flight into, say, Atlanta or Miami or something like that, and uh, the airplane would get over U.S. airspace, and 1,200 feet is a really good detonation altitude for a lot of <laughs> nuclear weapons. So, yeah, it's, it's mm -hmm. something to worry about, but, you know, there are a lot of things to be worried about. Right, you know? right. But... Uh, you got to, you'd have to have a highly trained suicide crew, and we know that's possible. But how often do you get those kind of crews? Yeah. Let's we have have a lot of government people that are looking for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. well, well, good thing. Let's let's wrap up uh, the case of Pen Char Ben Charles Padilla this way. Um, obviously. You have your suspicions. I agree, you know, maybe, you know, possibly 90% of what happened. Say you and I both get to live on this earth for another 50 years. Do you think this case will be solved as to actually really what happened? Not without somebody who knows something talking about it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, that it's probably the kind of story that somebody might rattle off on his deathbed. Mm-hmm. But as long as these guys are, are thriving and doing fine, no, they're not going to talk about it. Even though the statue of lim- this is what's really interesting. Even if they caught the guys that stole the airplane, who would charge them? What country would they be charged with? They didn't break any American crimes because the crime didn't take place on American soil. Hmm. So what do they have to fear? You know, uh, the Angolan government coming after them to charge them with theft? Hmm. That's not going to happen. Uh-oh. It's not. Maybe the uh, could the owner of the jet who, who would come after him, come after them somehow? You know, in civil court, maybe? Uh, if anybody was alive at that point, maybe. You know, you mm. got to remember how cheap life is in Africa. Mm. I mean, people die over there at the drop of a hat. Yeah. And nobody cares. I had one report came from a Scottish flight engineer who told me that Ben ran over a guy in Africa, killed him. Mm-hmm. Nothing happened to him. Hmm. Well, I was just thinking, like, the owner of the aircraft could charge, you know, once again, if Ben Charles Padilla is still alive, and once again, it's just conjecture, and we have some sightings and things, could char- come after him in civil court in the United States? Right? You, that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't be the proper jurisdiction for something like this? need a lawyer to answer that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, maybe we'll just leave it at that. Uh, Tim, what are you working on now? Where, where you're, uh, obviously, you're still working on this case, but uh, you and I had talked about a little bit about Flight 370. What are you doing regarding that now? Uh, not a whole lot regarding that. Uh, one of the guys that, that came out of the woodwork uh, got into that pretty deep mm-hmm. uh, in his job. And I, because I had some computer expertise with certain types of uh, software, Mm -hmm. uh, he had me run a whole bunch of simulations of, it basically was an exercise in four dimensions, time, distance, speed, uh, and and fuel. Mm -hmm. How do you make an airplane go from point A to point B and and, and arrive at a certain point in time uh, with with a certain amount of fuel? That that went on for about a solid month, and that's, I think, the evidence now is more conclusive than ever that it was suicide by pilot, uh, which Mm -hmm. is really sad. Yeah. Uh, But... uh, you know, they, they, they continue to try and refine the satellite information to determine exactly where the aircraft may be because it's hard to imagine how big that search area is. It is just enormous, and it's some of the deepest water on the whole planet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even if you can, you know, refine your estimates of where it could be by five miles or ten miles. By the time you narrow that band, you're talking hundreds of square miles that have been eliminated. You know, yeah. or so. Who, you know, so that's that's one thing I've been working on. Uh, I'm also working on another story for Air and Space right now on Great. lighted aircraft. Um, excuse me. On say oh, again. Say that again, please. I'm I'm working on a story for Air and Space right now on light. Attack aircraft. Wow. Uh, these are, are small airplanes that left the United States Air Force inventory back in 1991, and uh, the Air Force has been using F-16s and F-8, you know, F-15s, and and now the F-35s to uh, do close air support uh, for guys on the ground. Mm-hmm. But the problem, the problem with all this is, you know. An F-18, F-15, F-16, F-35, those are expensive aircraft to operate. You know, yeah. they're saying the F-35 is going to cost $35,000 a flight hour, whereas an light attack aircraft might cost you 1000 
So why don't we have some light attack aircraft out there? And it goes back to economics and money and politics and cultural attitude. So what does light technically? What does light attack aircraft mean to the to the layman? What would the, what would they see in their head? What should they see in their head when you'd say that? Well, the easiest way probably is to think about something you might have seen in World War II, a World War II fighter. With a propeller? Yeah. Or with... Yep. Turboprop, to be most accurate. Uh -huh. And it's the, 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 the popular engine for almost all those aircraft are the same engines that are powering prop dusters. And it's a, the Pratt & Whitney PT-6A. And it's... Uh, uh, incredibly reliable engine, it sips fuel comparatively, uh, and you can buy one for pennies on the dollar for what it would cost to get even an F-15. So let's say you you, uh, you decided, well, let's get rid of one F-35. Well, you could probably just about buy an entire squadron or more of light attack aircraft and use them all over the world. So they, op they represent the opposite extreme of the F-35. But the Air Force is so dependent on the F-35 is, is that they, they're trying to put as many dollars into it as they can, and they're trying to shut down the uh, A-10 Warthog mm -hmm. because if they, they think the F-35 will make a good ground attack aircraft. And that's where the light attack really shines is in the close air, uh, close air support. Right. Right, supporting ground troops, something like that. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Why, why send a sledgehammer when a fly swatter will do the job just as well? Yes, I, I agree with you on that. I agree. Anywhere else that uh, people can find you online? Do you have a website, Twitter, Facebook, anything that, that people can find you to find out what else you're doing? Uh, feel free to tell my listeners... You know, all your information if you, if you care to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like. Uh, well, okay. Uh, I, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's about as far as I, I really want to go. I do have a website, but it's, it's way old uh, and doesn't reflect what I'm doing these days. I'm doing a lot of writing. I'm trying to develop a TV show for the local PBS uh, affiliate here, and it will be a program that uh, focuses on aviation and space. Love it. And uh, we're in the process of putting together a pilot episode right now. So, uh, lots going on. All right. Uh, that sounds uh, great, Tim, and I'm sure the listeners uh, will be looking for you on that. Um, great interview. Thank you for joining me. This is a fascinating story. And uh, if anything uh, pops up regarding the story, I hope you will keep me uh, informed because I'd like to maybe do a follow-up sometime down the road regarding all this. Who knows? I would be happy to. I all right. appreciate your – All right, great. Thank you. Thanks for joining me on uh, Unfound. I, my pleasure. Glad to do it. All right. There you go, my interview with Tim Wright. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now, we should add on uh, some points to what was covered in that interview, some little points that were mentioned that we didn't get quite get into. We need to put on the record that Ben Charles Padilla's family totally rejects the idea that he stole that plane, that he was in cahoots with some other people to fly the plane to some other location, as we talked about in the interview. They totally um, reject that. They think that uh, the plane was hijacked. I guess the possibility that Ben Charles Padilla and um, his assistant went out there. There were already guys on the plane who overpowered those two men, took the plane into the air, and, and stole it. All right, that's what the family believes. You're going to have to choose to believe whatever you think. Do you think that Tim Wright – I personally believe that Tim Wright uh, is correct. And you should know that when this originally happened in 2003, because I'm an aviation geek, at least on the crash side, that 
I thought it was a pilot suicide, something like that. This guy uh, got onto the plane, maybe being away from his family, maybe he was having money problems, something like that, and had the skills to fly this plane. And Angola is so close to the Atlantic Ocean that he just took off and ditched it in the ocean somewhere and killed himself. What we know about aviation since then, that is not a crazy belief. We know what happened in the German wings uh, crash where the pilot intentionally um, um, crashed the plane into a mountain in Europe. That guy was suffering from some mental issues, depression, was not uh, was about to be suspended from his job because he couldn't pass some of the tests. We know about that story. Then there's Flight 370 that was mentioned at the end of the interview where it's pretty clear now that one of the pilots, most likely the the main pilot, took that plane and crashed it into the Indian Ocean on purpose. And if you start doing research on pilots crashing jets on purpose, there are quite a few stories out there about that. There are quite a few stories, more than you'd probably realize, where both the pilots and passengers got killed. The issue with that, and that's what I thought originally, but the issue is that none of these plane parts ever washed up on any shore anywhere, despite people having that suspicion and looking for the parts along the coast of Africa and elsewhere, depending on what the currents were doing in the Atlantic Ocean at the time. Could have maybe been crashed into the jungle somewhere. Uh, Once again, no reports of an explosion or sound of a crash or an unexplained fire or anything like that. Because you have to realize something, and once again, we got into that in the interview. If... Ben Charles Padilla and this guy tried to take off in the plane. Maybe they both had a death wish, let's say. They weren't going to be able to fly the plane too far, especially since night was coming. And we then you get into the phenomenon known as spatial disorientation. You have to be qualified to fly at night because of the effects that Flying in a plane can have on your equilibrium. You can think the plane is doing one thing when it's doing something else, and there are many stories about that. These two men, if they were alone, were not going to be able to fly that plane very far, given their lack of skills and given that it was becoming night very quickly. The plane wouldn't have gotten very far before it would have fallen out of the sky. Okay? So knowing all of that, you can see why Tim Wright's belief that this plane was stolen makes a lot of sense. Now, as far as the sightings of Ben Charles Padilla, the sightings of his assistant, and then the sightings of this unnamed third person, unfortunately I couldn't get Tim Wright to uh, say the person's name on the air. Maybe uh, on the air, maybe somewhere down the road we'll know who that person was or is. You'll just have to judge that for yourself. The truth is is that no authority, whether in the United States or elsewhere, have been able to track down Ben Charles Padilla. That's a fact. Uh, Nobody's been able to track down and take a picture of his assistant if he is in some jail somewhere. So you can see why this continues to be a story, and you can see why Tim Wright continues to to be on the case. I thought it was an interesting story. It is a little disconcerting about the aircraft market, the jet market, and what goes on. And as I said in the interview, that it's it's just a wonder, given what's happened since September 11th, that one of these jets that has disappeared uh, hasn't been used for an attack. You can judge that for yourself, why that hasn't happened. Maybe it's just uh, a matter of luck. I don't know. Could it have been a thrill ride gone wrong? Once again, we get back to why hasn't any of the plane been discovered anywhere, the the mangled wreckage anywhere, whether in the ocean or on land somewhere. Remember, it's been 13 years. 
could have been part of an insurance fraud case, but as once again stated in the, in the interview, that no insurance claim has ever been made by Mari Joseph or anyone, anyone else. And I'm not sure that Maury Joseph or Keith Irwin or any of these other men who were involved in the actual business side of the plane being there had the money, uh, had enough money to pay Ben Charles Padilla off to do it. So once again, we get back around to Tim Wright's suspicion that uh, Ben, along with this other guy, maybe the guy wasn't even in on it, this other person wasn't even in on it, maybe he just didn't know what he was getting into, That and there was somebody else on the plane, and they took off, never to be seen again. It, was, it landed in somewhere else in Africa and was being used to run, to drug run, to for human trafficking, some other use, and then once Tim's article came out, put a little too much suspicion out there, and it was probably trashed. But the reason this is called unfound is because the case isn't solved, and that means that all of you get to hypothesize what you believe happened. I would also urge you to find Tim's article, the original article that he wrote, and read it for yourself. We didn't we didn't cover everything in the article. We covered the high points, and I asked him some questions that uh, that I had after reading his article. Maybe after you read it, you'll have some questions as well, and maybe we can sort that out uh, in the comment section for this show. But this is the first show Unfound. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to do what I can to give you a high-quality show every week with a quality interview of somebody that's close to a, a person who has disappeared, whether it's a family member or a writer. I'll leave the rest of the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've been listening to Unfound.